Our project started about five years ago when a group of uh, semiconductor IC manufacturers approached us, actually we'd been working with them, and gave us a challenge. The challenge was to build a full-size, full-scale EUV lithographic exposure tool. The uh, historical perspective at the time was that uh, a lot of people were worried about the end of lithography based on excimer lasers. And so there were a number of technologies that were being proposed as the NGLs, the next generation lithographies, uh, ion beam projection, um, E-beam projection, direct right uh, E-beam, and uh, proximity x-ray. Well, all of those technologies had their technical champions, and the chip companies came to the national labs and basically asked us to become you know, the EUV uh, technology champion. <coughs> so Semitech was doing a very good thing at this time. They were running these NGL workshops, and all the technologies would get together, and they would review the risks in each of these technologies. Well, at the top of the list for EUV were the optics. Basically, people were saying that EUV would never work because you couldn't build the optics. And that's basically the subject of the talk that I have, is I'm going to go through the component technologies <coughs> that we had in building really the first of diffraction limited EUV um, optical system, full field optical system. And these are really all under the umbrella of precision engineering, so I really think they fit well into this conference. I think you know some of the uh, authors that we have here, Layton and uh, Ken Bladel and Gary Summergren, they've been traditionally with the ASPE Society. But there are really a lot of other contributors, and there are contributors from different national labs and the uh, sponsor, the EUV LLC, which I'll say a little bit more about in a minute. So just a little bit about what is EUV lithography. Well, lithography in general is transferring the image of the uh, reticle. This has the circuit information, and we want to print that onto a wafer, usually with a reduction imaging system. EUV is kind of special because the wavelength is so short, there really aren't any transmissive optics that work for EUV. So everything has to be reflective, including the uh, reticle itself. So EUV light comes in, it's incident on the reticle. There's an optical system here. This again is comprised of mirrors, reflective surfaces. And it's a reduction system, typically with aspheric mirrors. These are multi-layer coated that gives us the ability to have high reflectance at these short wavelengths. And then that image is placed on the photosensitive surface or the resist. So that's just sort of the basics of what lithography is and the EUV system. And the optics that I'm describing are the, essentially this imaging system that images the mask onto that wafer. Um, to have maybe a slightly different take on the roadmap that Tony was showing, what I show here is the minimum feature size. Typically, these are the technology nodes, and I have these rounded off to some more, more of the traditional colloquial numbers that, that the industry uses. And these are the year of the introduction of different technologies. And that's when these, these technologies, the lithography using 193, 157, and then EUV 13.4, when will they first go into production? And so there may be several layers on a particular chip, but only one or two of those layers are what we call the critical layers, and those will be using these leading edge technologies. And so we see 193 covering the 130 and the 100 nanometer feature sizes. 157 coming in for really one node here at 70 nanometers, and then EUV coming in at 50 nanometers. Um, one thing that's really important that's happening right now is that the chip companies, several of the big chip companies for microprocessors and memory products are in the process of placing beta tool orders. So what is a beta tool? It's the tool that comes out from the stepper companies that is a pre-production model, but is as close to the production model as possible. So once that order is placed for a beta tool, that's basically a commitment by the chip makers that they're going to make room on their fab floors for that tool. And so that's a commitment to that technology. And it's a commitment of thousands of man years of work by the tool companies to come out with that, that technology. And so we've been in the R&D phase now, in the beta tool phase, uh, we'll see the beta tools introduced in 2004, and then that leads into production in 2007. There's another node out in the future here at 35 nanometers, and EUV is really the, the sort of clear choice for high volume chip manufacturing for, for these nodes. Now there are lower order um, application specific um, integrated circuits. 
perhaps EUV won't be used for those, but for the large volume applications like memory and uh, microprocessors, that seems to be the accepted choice. So our, our sponsor is a consortium of chip makers. It's a fully privately funded um, uh, effort, the EUV LLC, Limited Liability Company. Um, these are the six companies that are partnering and providing the funding, and we work on a daily basis with technical representatives from these, these companies. Um, there's a col collaboration of three national labs, and to make that a rather seamless collaboration, we formed our own organization, sort of, so you can deal with one organization, it has the name Virtual National Laboratory, and so contracts can be placed directly with the VNL, and that then they're distributed among the other laboratories. So we try to have seamless integration. And the key objectives of this work were to build that alpha class tool, identify all the risk areas and demonstrate solutions, de de develop the key enabling technology, and to uh, transfer that or work with companies to make sure that there's infrastructure in place. Because if, if the technology stays in the labs, it's basically a failure at that point. It has to go out and work with the companies. The uh, um, exposure tool that we're building, and this is being integrated at Sandia Livermore, which is across the street from Lawrence Livermore, is shown here. This has been functioning with an initial set of optics, and it's going to be upgraded to a final set of optics in the next few months. But we have on the right side here the illumination module, which has the laser plasma source and the condenser optics. Uh, then there's the uh, exposure body over here, which has the reticle subsystem, the wafer subsystem. And then in the middle is the imaging system that I'm going to be describing. And in, in the industry, those are called the projection optics, and uh, the, the assembled housing is the projection optics box, and then the jargon is the PO box. And so I'll have PO box on a number of my slides. So this is a schematic, a skeleton schematic of the optical system in our alpha tool. On the right side, we have the condenser system with the laser plasma source. There's a six-channel condenser where we collect light and we have uh, essentially a prism pair down here with the grazing incidence uh, flats and spheres that bring the six channels together, combine them for illumination on the mask. There's the imaging system here. This is the projection optics here. There are four off-axis aspheric elements here, uh, and they're multi-layer coded, and then that's imaged onto the wafer. The uh, technologies that really do comprise a lot of precision engineering are, are listed here. Um, optical design and tolerancing, optical fabrication. Each of these had to have some development. There was actually a risk going into this project because none of these were exactly in the right place for, for building this uh, imaging system. The interferometry, optical scattering analysis, multi-layer deposition, the mechanical design that I think Leighton Hales described at ASPE, the alignment system, and then for closing this all with sort of a performance prediction to determine what effect the errors have. The PO box shown here, it's a super invar structure. Um, you can see that there are some uh, yellow areas here. Those are the zero door optics that are held in there with an exact constraint design uh, with the bipods, three pairs of bipods on each of the optics. Uh, those are referenced to this global coordinate system for the uh, overall PO box. What we show here is really a mi major milestone for us was the delivery of the zero door substrates from Tinsley, which is now by the name ASML Optics. So this, this took three and a half years to deliver these, these substrates. They're four zero-door substrates, very, very thick. Um, they're shown here in their mounting fixtures. Again, super invar bipods and, and a uh, mounting structure here. The idea was that they, the metrology during the fabrication would be the same as the mounting structure during the ins installation into the exposure tool. So if there's gravity sag associated with each of these structures, it would be the same during the polishing and the metrology as, the, as well as in the exposure tool. Uh, big table of numbers here, but it really tells, I think, an important story. And uh, we, we divided the specifications on these optics into three areas, the figure, the mid-spatial frequency roughness, and the high spatial frequency roughness. And the spatial scales are shown here, where we include spatial periods all the way down to a millimeter for figure, mid-spatial frequency roughness of a millimeter to a micron, and then the high frequency roughness are smaller features than, than a micron. And what these correspond to, of course, the figure determines the quality of the image and the distortion. 
Um, the mid-frequency roughness is in plane or in um, field scattering. It, it lessens the uh, contrast of the system. It provides flare. And so that's perhaps going to turn out to be the most important of the specifications on optics as we look into the future. And then this is wide angle scattering, which is essentially the loss from the system, scattering outside the field of view. The, the specifications for our alpha tool are shown here. Quarter nanometer RMS figure error out to these, these high frequencies. Uh, 0.2 nanometers, two angstrom roughness in this frequency band, and an angstrom RMS out at the high frequency band. And, and I find you know, these, these, these numbers three or four years ago were really daunting and, and that's the basis for thinking that maybe EUV isn't possible when looking at these numbers and thinking about where we were, what was the state of the art. And so what I gathered here was essentially the best optics that were um, delivered to date in 1997 when we began this project and we were a factor of three or four off in each of these categories. And the key is really meeting all of these specifications simultaneously. Even at the time, you could go meet these, these specifications individually on an optic, but doing them all at the same time was, was a real trouble. So we had two sets of optics that were delivered by Tinsley. Shown here are the measurements made on these optics. And you can see there's roughly um, an improvement made in each of these categories as, as we move to the set two optics, which were delivered at the end of the year 2000. And so we feel very, very good about the performance of these optics and the development that Tinsley put into their polishing process and also in the metrology that supported this effort. But this imaging system that we've built is not all the way ready for production. And if I guess at what the specifications will be in these broad categories for production tools, again, to be introduced in 2007, we're looking at cutting the figure errors, essentially all of these errors, by another factor of two to three. So there's definitely some important development that needs to take place in both the fabrication technology as well as the metrology to support that. Uh, Gary Summergren has described an interferometer that we developed in order to measure the figure accuracies on these optics. The decision to develop this interferometer wasn't taken lightly. We spent a lot of time talking with um, the fabrication vendor and looking at different alternatives. But the important point here is that we had to assess the accuracy of these surfaces and it's compared to the optical design. So I'll just uh, give a brief description here. We have a short coherence laser. It's a, a frequency double YAG laser. We split the beam into a test beam here and a reference beam here. Uh, we stepped on the uh, test side and there's a delay line where we can essentially um, move one beam out or with respect to the test beam here. Both of these are injected into a, an optical fiber which is brought up to a small pinhole. There's a pinhole in a mirror located essentially at this point. The test beam um, comes out and forms a set of nearly perfect spherical waves as it goes through that aperture. Those waves come out, off, reflect off the test optic and come back. Now we've adjusted the delay line here so that as that wave comes back, it then matches up with the reference leg. And then those two waves then are combined. And then we image the, uh, the, the set of waves and this optic under test onto the CCD camera. And you might ask, well, how accurate are those spherical waves? We've done a lot of tests on that where you produce uh, multiple pinholes next to one another and you essentially duplicate a Young's double slit experiment and you can calculate very accurately what that fringe pattern should look like and we can compare that with what we've seen. And so there, we're quite confident that the accuracy of the spherical waves is not the issue um, in, in, in determining sort of the limits of this approach. So we're, we actually had some uh, comparisons with other types of interferometry, the, the traditional sphere, spherical interferometry, multi-position test. Carl Zeiss has built an interferometer, the Direct 100, for measuring aspheric optics. We've just gone through a comparison with Zeiss on measuring some of these surfaces. And we're very confident that this approach, as well as the other Zeiss approach, are working well at the 0.25 nanometer level. Extending this down to the production levels we need for the 0.12 or 0.1 um, nanometer optics in the future isn't very clear. And we've done a lot of error analysis and a lot of it's been associated with the imaging lens here and the quality of that imaging lens. 
And there's actually a new approach for interferometry that's put, being put together right now that does away with that lens. But that's something I can talk about offline. These are the measurements that were made of the uh, set two Tinsley optics. And we can see these were all made by, measurements were made by that phase shifting diffraction interferometer. There's a lot of dynamic bandwidth in this measurement. We're not a noise limited at all. You can look at the color bar here, minus one nanometer to plus one nanometer. So it's a fairly narrow band. Um, what you can see is there's a lot of structure from the polishing with the small tool that goes over the surface. There are, there's sort of a mixture of low frequency and high frequency um, information on this. And we spent a lot of time studying the PSD and the impact of the waviness that you can see on imaging. And actually the millimeter and several millimeter type waviness is, is a key issue because it, again, leads to near angle scattering which decreases contrast in an exposure tool. So again, that's a place for further work. One thing, one, one issue that came up, there was some post polishing machining done on this M2 optic. And as the machining was completed, the optic sprung a little bit. And so the thing is, well, did that ruin the optic? Well, it's the very importance of having your modeling tied in directly with your fabrication. So we were immediately able to do some ray tracing through the system and look at the impact of the aberrations. And it turns out that if, if you look at the, that impact, it basically is a a uniform astigmatism over the field, and that's something that's very easily aligned out. So even though it has driven up the figure number, it essentially would be invisible in the, interferom the alignment interferometer. So we decided not to go back and take the risk of trying to touch that up. Uh, with the finish measurements, uh, again, you see a lot of uh, millimeter type um, information leading to, again, areas for improvement. But we saw the big improvement from Tinsley and going from the set one to the set two optics. Uh, these are essentially at the same scale here, so you can see that the millimeter roughness has been um, driven down. Perhaps the most enabling technology for EUV has been the development of high reflectance metal multilayers. These enable us to use near normal incidence optics. Working with normal incidence versus grazing incidence optics is just essential in terms of the optical design because of the degrees of freedom that you have then in correcting aberrations. So what I show here is a TEM of a molysilicon multilayer. Molysilicon is the workhorse, although we're doing a lot of work on uh, different kinds of materials to improve on molysilicon. This will be the basis for a lot of development over the next several years. Um, this is the reflectance here that you might see as a function of wavelength. It's very peaked reflectance. And that's because this acts as a, as a Bragg reflector. So it's very wavelength dependent at a given angle of incidence. And so we're seeing here um, maximum reflectance at about 13.5 uh, nanometers. Now the ideal reflectance from, from these structures is only 75%. The rest goes into absorption in the material. And so that's a lot of loss compared to current optical um, systems, eczema systems. But this is considered very high for soft x-rays. So that, that's a trade-off that we see when we take that step into EUV. Uh, we have uh, worked with the Vico company from, from New York and designed a special coating machine for, for doing these molysilicon multilayers. Uh, this is uh, roughly a meter across this uh, system. Um, um, controlling the thickness of the coating and the uniformity is essentially cru is crucial because if you spend all this time developing these, these tight figure control during the polishing, you don't want to destroy that during a coating operation. So being in control of the kinematics and the fixturing is essential. And also because coating is essentially a convolution process, we can control the speed with which the, the optics travel in front of the targets to control the thickness. And in fact, you can do thickness modulation. Many of the optics that we've coded have a thickness gradient so that we can accommodate changing angles of incidence on those optics. So there's a large platter here, roughly a meter in diameter, each of the optics you know, have their own spinners. Each has its own velocity control. And the platter has a velocity control so that as that optic passes underneath that target, it then has its thickness gradient controlled very, very precisely. There are really uh, three major factors that we look for in, 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 in judging a coating. One is the reflectance. 65% uh, is what we achieved on these optics. 
we, we can achieve 70% in sort of laboratory samples, but in, in, in for the set two optics, this is a little bit lower because of the different type of process we use for controlling uniformity as well. It's also important that the optics um, have the peak wavelength in the same location because if the wavelengths are in different locations, then no light gets through the system. It's shown here are, is the reflectance versus wavelength where all of the optics were overlaid with one another. And so there was very good matching here. So essentially we had about a 99.3% um, um, throughput factor based on this wavelength effect. Now next we also need to have that thickness control very precise so we don't lose the figure control. And so we have maps of the film thickness across the optics over 100 millimeter uh, period here. The specification that we had was plus or minus 0.2 percent, which would be plus or minus six, six angstroms across that, that period here shown for M2. And it's the same for the other mirrors as well. And we were well within that specification. And if you, if you calculate, if you actually take the numbers and calculate, well, what is the added figure error? It's a very small number, um, less than an angstrom RMS contribution. So effectively, the, the coatings are not contributing anything to the figure error. Um, I would put out a caveat that the measurement of this is not something we did with an interferometer because the number is so small. What we do is we measure the wavelength shift and by measuring the peak wavelength across the part and relate that to the, to the coding uh, uh, despacing thickness. Given those coded optics, we have to assemble them into some kind of a structure so that we can have an optical system. The first thing we have to do is find out where in space those aspheric surfaces are. The interferometer gives us a measure of the aspheric surface itself with respect to certain datum surfaces that are on the optic. The next thing we do is we map out the position of those datum surfaces using a coordinate measuring machine with respect to uh, tooling balls that are on the mounting cells that I uh, showed you in one of the earlier slides. So now we have the surface related to the datums related to the tooling balls. Now we relate those to a global coordinate system based on, again, a master set of balls that are on the uh, PO box, and that's being shown here. In fact, we go through the assembly of the mounting cells into the PO box without, without the optics in place because we're working off the positions of the localized uh, tooling balls on the, uh, on the mounting cells. <coughs> How close do we need to position the optics with respect to this global coordinate system? A fairly, fairly loose tolerance, really, plus or minus a couple hundred microns in space for each of those surfaces. But where it gets tough is that this is a stacked tolerance and going backwards to what the interferometer said and where, where the position of that surface is, you pick up a lot of uncertainty in that operation. So what we did is we took those optics, did our best job at the mechanical assembly and looked at, well, what is the accuracy of the wavefront that we get? It has to be sufficiently well aligned just from the mechanical assembly that you get fringes in the interferometer because if you don't get fringes, you, don't, you really can't go anywhere. In fact, we'd like it to be closer than that. You'd like to be within the range of an alignment algorithm that we have so we can have essentially a linear convergence to the final wavefront. And so our target was to obtain a wavefront of about 50 nanometers. This is done in a visible light interferometer. And we were very fortunate here to achieve a 5 nanometer RMS wavefront just based on the mechanical assembly of, of this system. And this is shown here for PO Box 1 with a very similar result for, for PO Box 2. Given this assembled optical system, what do we do now? We have to go through interferometric alignment. We make use of the spherical wave interferometer idea that uh, we talked about earlier for measuring the parts. And so at the wafer plane and up at the mask plane, we have two uh, flat uh, um, windows basically with a set of pinholes in each of these sets of windows. This arc shape is actually the shape of the printed field that we're working with. I didn't describe it, but this is a ring field imaging system, and so that, that's the shape of the field. We have 45 field points that we carry out interferometry at. So we bring the fiber up to one of the pinholes at the wafer plane, propagate a spherical wave through the optical system. Similarly to before, we have a delayed reference beam that comes out and matches that beam, mixes with it at the, at, this, at the mask plane here. Both beams are then brought into the CCD camera and then we image the fringes at that point. And then we go through standard phase shifting interferometry to do that at the 45 field points. So we carry out the alignment by taking the information at all the field points, 
breaking it down into the Zernike components, then we have essentially a linear algebra problem of connecting all of those Zernike coefficients with the sensitivity matrix and the degrees of freedom for adjusting the optics. And we use a singular value decomposition method for finding out what's the optimum optimum set of corrections for the mechanical adjustments that we have. Um, so what, what are the results of the interferometric alignment? Well shown here are two uh, field points. So we have a circular pupil, so we see a circular field here for each of the field points. And these are the errors that are measured in the interferometer. And these include uh, high spatial frequencies, not just the Zernike components, but it goes out also to the millimeters type, type uh, spatial periods that are on the optics. And so for PO set one, we achieved about two nanometers RMS. And for PO set two, we were down about uh, 1.2 nanometers RMS. And those are sort of typical, but I'll, I'll show you the distribution of these over the field because that's, that's an important parameter. But again, these include the residuals of the measurement, not just the Zernike components. So if we look at the distribution of the wavefront error over that field, um, we have that shown here, and we're looking here at just the Zernike components. And so for PO set one, the uh, mean over the field was about 1.2 nanometers, where, where it ranged from about one to one and a half nanometers over that field. You would like that to be fairly well controlled and uniform so you don't lead to CD variations during your printing with lithographic printing. For PO set two, it was an interesting result. The, the, the best field point that we aligned to came out to about 0.6 nanometers RMS. That was con consistent with what we would predicted we would see from, from the ray tracing. But the variation over the field was a lot larger than what we anticipated. And so we saw that, that, that the worst points were up to two nanometers. And so there was too large of a variation over the field. So the indication is that there's something wasn't closed in the process. There was either some residual error in the earlier uh, measurement of the individual optics that led to, to the wrong prediction, or something was wrong in the, in the mechanical motions of the system. So although this, this meets the goal for lithographic printing for our program, the fact that we couldn't close on the science here has bothered us a lot. And right now, we're going through the realignment of this system, and we'll be bringing it back to the coordinate measuring machine, again, getting closure on where those optics are, at least within, within those tolerances. And what we would expect to see is shown here, a variation from about 0.6 up to 1 nanometer. So we expect to to bring that worst point down by, by a nanometer RMS. Um, one, one sort of interesting point is there's, there's an entire interferometry and lithography program at the synchrotron at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, at the advanced light source. And so we can do at wavelength interferometry using 13 nanometer light. And the question always comes up, well, is alignment at the visible the same as alignment at EUV? Because you have penetration the UV light into the multilayer, whereas with the light you reflect off the top surface. And so we show here is the measurements made here at the uh, visible light, about 1.6, at 13 nanometers, 1.65. And so with this, it was fairly good agreement. This is the point-to-point -point difference between these two, two images. So this, this would suggest that things agree fairly well. Again, there's something that, that hasn't closed well enough for us. There is a residual astigmatism term that always turns up different between the EUV and the visible. And we think that's because of something that's wrong in the visible light interferometer. And that's something, again, we're going through that right now with fine tooth comb, trying to find is there a little wedged window in there or something that's, that's kicking in some systematic astigmatism over the field. But it's been valuable to have two interferometers to have comparisons with one another. So we took the uh, PO box, once it was assembled, we, we brought it up there, you, you saw the interferometry results. So we also did some printing results at, at Lawrence Berkeley by br essentially working with light from one of the undulator beam lines. And I'll just show you a couple of results here. So this system, when we began this project, was aimed at 100 nanometer feature sizes. So EUV was originally going to be inserted at 100 nanometer feature sizes. Since then, there's been some inflation. Now EUV is going to be inserted at the 50 nanometer node, but we were already ballistic on building this system, which was designed for that feature size with a numerical aperture of 0.1. So at, at the way it was designed, we're seeing excellent imaging. These are 100 nanometer contacts, 
100 nanometer lines and spaces. We see very little uh, isolated to dense bias as you look at the different features. Uh, minimal amount of line end um, rounding at the end here, and a very small amount of, of line edge roughness. So this, this is actually very satisfying to us, and we're working with essentially the best resists that are available. We, EUV has actually more robust in the resist mode than, than some of the other lithographies. We're, it's basically a 248 resist. If we push that system, what can we do with it? We can go down to 45 nanometer, 39 nanometer, 39 nanometer features. And the quality here is not what you'd call lithographic quality, but we're pushing the system way beyond its, its design point. And, and, but nevertheless, we're still seeing reasonable um, exposure of the isolated features, which is very difficult to do when you're way out beyond that uh, envelope. So, so in summary, um, We've uh, constructed a diffraction-limited system, actually two diffraction-limited systems, for, and really demonstrated that that's feasible. Um, the wavefront errors, uh, the Zernike terms, were less than a nanometer RMS. Um, the aspheric optics have been produced commercially with figure accuracies of less than 0.25 nanometers RMS. And I, I could say that based on our work with Carl Zeiss as well, that these are available at this level from two different commercial suppliers. Multi-layer coating development is successful, and that actually meets the production requirements for uh, multi-layer coatings. And the, really the heart, the precision assembly and alignment has met EUV goals, because again, we couldn't, if we couldn't obtain fringes within that system during the assembly, we couldn't have gone anywhere with this. There's further work in optical fabrication and interferometry. We need to achieve figure accuracy somewhere on the order of one angstrom RMS. It's a factor of two at least beyond where we are today. One thing I didn't say a lot about was the rigorous error budgeting. In these first alpha systems, we, we were working basically to the limit in each of these component technologies. And do your best with essentially the bottom line error budget. But I think if we look at sort of the, the forgiveness that alignment can give us to various Zernike modes, what we'll, we'll find is that rigorous error budgeting will pay off and give us some forgiveness in some areas in this system. Thank you.